and I'm thrilled that you can be here. This is uh, a series that we do. We have these uh, talks every, uh, every other Thursday uh, during the year, and this is an opportunity for us to really showcase our faculty across our 15 departments and schools uh, and the, the remarkable variety of scholarship and creative work that our faculty are doing and to uh, have them introduce and discuss their work with the community in general. So we're thrilled you can be here. Um, before I uh, introduce the speaker, I want to just uh, make a few uh, uh, re uh, reminders. First of all, if you, we have a lot of events going on <coughs> in the uh, division of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. If you are so inclined, you can log on to the Facebook page and give it a thumbs up. And you can uh, find out all the events. That's a good place to find out all the things we're doing. You can also log on our website. Uh, we have speaker series. We've got um, uh, music presentations. Uh, there's theater. There's art shows. There's a lot of stuff going on that uh, I think you would enjoy. Uh, so please check that out. Now, in particular, I'd like to mention an upcoming uh, just our uh, annual AHSS Distinguished Speaker Series. And it's an annual lecture where we bring in a well-known uh, person who has some connection to the liberal arts. Uh, this year, we're really exciting. Uh, we're bringing in um, uh, the closest uh, 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 sort of doppelganger to um, Indiana Jones. Uh, so if you ever want to see, be one of those students when Indiana Jones is giving a lecture, uh, uh, this, is, this will be your moment. Uh, the person's name is uh, Wade Davis. And Wade Davis is an ethnobiologist, an anthropologist. He has an, um, the amazing title of National Geographic Explorer in Residence. He's also a filmmaker. He's written several books. He's a, really an amazing guy. If you go on his website and uh, see the remarkable variety of uh, projects and places in the world that he's traveled, he has studied indigenous languages and cultures. And what he'll be talking to us about is his um, most recent book, into, into the Silence, colon, The Great War, Mallory, and the Conquest of Everest. And it's a remarkable book on uh, Mallory's uh, ascent to Everest and what led up to it uh, coming out of World War I and what it meant in terms of the kinds of people that were involved in this effort and uh, the rem how difficult it was, especially given the kinds of equipment they had then and what it meant to people who were uh, uh, watching this and tracking what was happening with this ascent of Everest and the mysteries and the, and the wonderful stories around this and uh, about coming out of World War I as well. So I really highly recommend um, that you check this out. It's a free lecture and it's on April 16th. So uh, you can log on and uh, we have sold, not sold, we have reserved a lot of, uh, of, uh, of tickets for this. So we still have some left. Please uh, uh, come join us. Uh, today, I'm thrilled to be introducing uh, Kateri McRae from the psychology department. Uh, before doing this interim dean uh, gig, I was in the psychology department, still am in the psychology department, and uh, uh, Kateri just reminded me that the last time I introduced her was when she gave a job talk about five years ago. And um, uh, Kateri uh, got her uh, bachelor degree um, in uh, biology and in drama from Stanford in 2002. She got her master's and PhD from the University of Arizona. Then she went back to uh, Stanford as a postdoctoral fellow and uh, she uh, now has been an assistant professor since 2010. Uh, Kateri's area of research is uh, a remarkable, very exciting area, which is I assume why a lot of people are here. Um, we, the, the field of understanding how cognition, emotion, thinking, problem solving, perception, etc., is related to what goes on inside our head and our brain processes has been revolutionized over the last 30 or so years. And Kateri is a, is a, is a part of a generation of uh, uh, neuroscientists and psychologists who have been uh, opening the doors to understanding how the brain relates to these kinds of processes. In particular, she focuses on emotion and emotion processes. And so um, when people first started looking at the way brain related to thinking, people didn't think you'd be able to study emotion. It's just, you know, you know, 
it's too hard. The computers can't do it. Spock can't do it. And uh, emotion is too hard to pin down and certainly to relate to physical processes that are going on in your brain. Turns out that's really wrong. And I think Kateri is going to present some uh, work uh, showing why, uh, what kinds of things have been discovered about this over the last uh, uh, many years and about her work in this area in particular. Uh, she's been very productive at the University of Denver. She has published uh, an, over 32 papers and uh, book chapters. Uh, she's given many talks all over the world on this topic, so I'm thrilled to introduce Katuri McRae. Thank you, Interim Dean Roberts. And I'm really thrilled to be here. I have enjoyed attending this lecture series, and I'm very pleased to be sharing my work today instead of absorbing it, which Again, I've also enjoyed. Very, very roughly, I identify it as an affective neuroscience, and that's affect as in the emotion in contrast to cognitive neuroscience. And I'm really interested in a lot of different ways that emotion and cognition, or feeling and thinking, interact, and how the brain is structured uh, might sort of inform what we know about how emotions and thoughts interact. Today I'm going to be sort of zooming in into one aspect of my work, which is to study how the brain controls emotion, or in general, how we control emotion. So what can we do in order to influence the emotions that we have? And this work generally is referred to as work on emotion regulation. And affective neuroscientists, affective scientists of all sorts, were not the very first people to notice that there is this remarkable human ability to control emotion. Uh, and it's actually been sort of well known for a long time that there are different things that we can do that influence the emotional responses that we have. So this is a quote from Henry VIII, and it reads, Be advised, I say again, there is no English soul more stronger to direct you than yourself. If with the staff of reason you would quench or but allay the fire of passion. So that's what I'm sort of focusing in on today, is how the sap of reason might quench or but allay the fire of passion. So in the brain, how do we find the fire of passion? There are actually a number of structures uh, in the brain that have been identified as responding to emotional situations. I'm mostly going to be talking about the parts of the brain that respond to negative emotional situations today, but not entirely. Um, and these sort of cartoon regions that I'm uh, demonstrating right here are the parts of the brain that are particularly involved when emotions are generated in a visual way. I'll be showing you some examples of how we generate uh, of negative emotions in a visual way. And one of the things that I want you to keep in mind is that there are certain parts of the brain that are involved in generating emotions, but there are also a number of different ways that an emotional response is instantiated. So this box over here is to remind you that when we have an emotion, there's the emotional experience that we have. This is the sort of subjective experience, the feeling that we have when we all say, I feel this way, and most of us call that some kind of emotion. There are also changes in your body, changes to your peripheral physiology, things like your heart rate, the activity of your, uh, the, the sweat glands in your skin change, not surprisingly, when you're feeling a particular emotion. Um, at, at your heart rate, blood pressure, all sorts of peripheral physiological changes. We express emotions with our face and with our bodies, and then we behave differently when we're feeling certain emotions than when we're not feeling those emotions. So these are sort of all the multifaceted ways that emotions end up kind of um, seeping out into the world is expression, physiology, uh, experience, and behavior. And if this is the fire of passion, what does the sap of reason look like? The sap of reason in the brain is primarily uh, sort of concerned with prefrontal and parietal structures that are thought to be involved in cognitive control. And today I'm mostly actually going to be focusing on these, um, uh, on these fire of passion regions, the red regions, a little bit more. Um, but a lot of the other work that I do sort of really dives into how these two types of regions interact how these blue cartoony regions influence the red cartoony regions. It gets a little bit more complicated when they're not cartoons. I wish I could just study the way cartoon <laughs> brains worked. It would be a lot simpler. Um, but in general, these regulation regions are able to exert control. It's important for you to realize that they're able to inhibit or enhance or otherwise sort of modify the activity uh, in these red regions. And that consequently, 
all of these different aspects of emotionally responding change. So when you engage in some kind of control active action, when you engage this act of reason, that then influences your experience, your physiology, your expression, and your behavior. So today, I'm gonna to sort of zoom in on one really important kind of emotion regulation called cognitive reappraisal. And cognitive reappraisal is defined as sort of changing the interpretation or the framing of an emotional stimulus in a way that changes the emotional meaning. So what does this actually look like in real life? Let's say that I'm sitting in my office and I receive an email that says, your feedback is ready for a grant that you've submitted. So I've submitted a grant for funding to keep doing this exciting research and I have the feedback in my email and I open up the email and it says your grant was not funded and here are all the reasons why, right? So that's an external stimulus that causes me to feel a certain way and I'm seeing in that those negative feelings that might be sadness and disappointment and frustration and a little bit of failure. And I could sort of go with my initial interpretation of this email and think, well, my work just isn't really good enough to get money right now, and I guess I didn't spend quite enough, long enough on that application, or maybe my research is sort of, sort of out of favor with these funding agencies, I'll have to think of a different way to frame it. And it might be sort of very heavy and kind of weighing on me all of these negative interpretations of this feedback that I've gotten. But I can change my interpretation and say, maybe this is an opportunity. Maybe this feedback, all these reasons why I didn't get the grant, can help me next time. Maybe I can take that feedback when I'm revising the grant, and then maybe I'll be in a better position. So that sort of reinterpretation of the exact same stimulus is a whole bunch of negative things they've said about my work. But thinking about it from that different angle, that it might be a tool to help me, is exactly what cognitive reappraisal is all about. So a lot of other people sort of refer to cognitive reappraisal as a reevaluation, a reinterpretation, a reconsideration of an emotional stimulus that changes the way you feel. And this might sound familiar to any of you who are familiar with cognitive behavioral therapy. So cognitive reframing is a really key part of cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive therapies, which are a very sort of um, popular and empirically validated way to treat a lot of mood and anxiety disorders. So not only is this a really powerful way uh, to study the way we can change emotions in the lab, which is mostly what I do, this is a really good real world technique that often is used in a therapeutic context as well. So it has some really good real world applications. All right, again, the people who invented the term cognitive reappraisal were not the first to stumble upon this idea that changing how you think changes how you feel. Again, Shakespeare through Hamlet says, there is nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So it's the way we conceive of an event that determines the emotions that follow. All right, the first research study that I'm gonna to talk to you about today was actually designed to be a study of gender differences. I was looking for gender differences in this sap of reason, right? In the ability to use cognitive reappraisal to change how you're feeling. Most of the rest of my talk will actually not focus on gender differences. What happened was is we discovered something a little unexpected when we were looking for gender differences that caused our research to take a little bit of a turn. And so I'm gonna sort of take you with me on the turn. Uh, but to get there, you have to understand what we were looking for in terms of gender differences. So before I dive into the gender differences study, I wanna prepare you for how it is that we're able to study emotion in the lab. As Rob pointed out, it's not the simplest thing in the world to study emotion in a laboratory setting. It's a little harder to study it in the context of an fMRI scanner when people are lying on their back. If any of you have ever, ever gotten a medical MRI for a knee or a shoulder or anything like that, it's not the most comfortable, sort of soothing environment. Uh, and as much as I'd like to hover outside of my colleagues' doors and wait for them to get grant feedback and then jump in their office and say, ah, what are you feeling? That's not sort of the most rigorous way to study how emotions influence people and how thinking can change those emotions. So what we end up doing is distilling down the essence of what we're interested in, the essence of cognitive reappraisal, into a well-controlled laboratory task. And each trial of this laboratory task involves showing people a picture and then telling them what to do with a picture. So I'm gonna have all of you pretend that you are uh, a participant in my study. I won't have you pretend that you're in the MRI machine, so that would be rather unpleasant, but you can pretend that you're in the lab and you're seeing the trial unfold. So the first thing that happens in a single trial is that the participants are given an instruction about what to do for the next few seconds of their life. In this case, that instruction is to look. 
This is our non-regulation instruction, so no sap of reason involved in this instruction. Just the sort of basic control condition. Then they see an image, a picture, that's a still image from sort of uh, something you might see in everyday life. Uh, and this is a neutral image, so this is really our control condition because there's no regulation going on and there's actually no emotion going on unless you have a very particular experience with umbrellas. <laughs> this is a neutral image for most people in our studies. Then we ask people how negative they feel. We ask them every single time how negative they feel, even if we're showing something we don't expect to make them feel negative because we just need to make sure we have to see the data before we, we believe that they didn't really feel anything negative. And they get a brief break, we tell them to relax. This only lasts for a couple of seconds, but it actually really does help to give people it just a few seconds before they go on to the next trial. All right, so on the next trial, they might see a similar instruction. In this case, they're also seeing the look instruction, but the image that follows is slightly negative. So they might see an image like this, and again, the instruction is to look at the image, pay attention to it, and respond as they naturally would. We're not asking them to engage in any regulation on this trial. Again, we ask people to rate how negatively they feel. In this case, most people are further on the scale. They're closer to a three and a four than they were to a one and a two for that umbrella picture. And then again, they get a, brief, a few brief moments to relax. Finally, this is the trial of interest. And of course, when participants are doing this in our studies, they do these trials over and over again. For you here, uh, it's only these three, or otherwise I would spend the rest of my time sort of just uh, having you go through the trials. This is the instruction to regulate. So in this first study, in this gender differences study, the cue to regulate was the word decrease, and we trained participants beforehand, before they even went in the scanner, that decrease meant reappraise. So we gave them some practice pictures, we were able to get some sample reappraisals from them, we were able to, to sort of make sure that they knew what we meant by reappraise, they weren't just distracting themselves or thinking of other completely unrelated things, and then we would show them a negative picture, and when they were looking at the picture, their job was to generate these reinterpretations and really try to convince themselves that one of those reinterpretations was true. So does anybody have a reappraisal, a reinterpretation of this particular negative image that you might tell yourself to feel better if you were actually in one of these experiments? Yes. Thank God he was rescued and he's breathing now. Thank God he was rescued and at least he's breathing now. That's a, a really good reappraisal, reinterpretation, sort of looking on the bright things. At least he's in a hospital setting getting help. What, are there any other reappraisals that come to mind? Thank God it's not me. Thank God it's not me. That's actually not uncommon for participants to say, well, at least it's not me. Or an extension of that, at least it's not someone I care about. It's too bad for that person, but thank goodness it's not affecting my, my family or my life. Any others? Yes. If it's a CPAP device, he's getting better rest, and at least it's an improvement. I'm not quite sure I know what everything in that sentence meant, uh, but sh sure, it sounds like that's a, that is, you're focusing a little bit on the technical detail, which is one of the things that people do when they reappraise, to assure, assure yourself that he's um, comfortable, at least he's calm and comfortable. These are all really wonderful reappraisals that would get four stars in our lab if you were um, in this particular experiment. Then again, we ask people how they feel. Crucially, this is how they feel at the end of the reappraisal process after they've tried to generate a reappraisal and really convince themselves that it's true. And then, if, of course, they get a break before the next trial. So one of the things that we can do is we can aggregate across all of these ratings of negativity, these negative affect ratings, to see whether or not this instruction to reappraise actually works. And what we saw in this study, I'm gonna show you the graph now that has the negative affect ratings. If you are a graph person, I have a lot of graphs for you today. If you are not a graph person, I'm gonna do my best to make sure that what I'm saying explains the graph. So if you get, if, you, if you're not a fan of graphs, feel free to avert your eyes and just listen. <laughs> so this graph shows the average ratings of negative affect in the three different experimental conditions. And we're sort of most interested in two different differences. The first one is the change from the look neutral pictures, those umbrella pictures, to the look negative pictures when people are not regulating. And thankfully, we see significant increases. So people do indeed feel more negative to the negative pictures than they do for the neutral picture, pictures. 
Um, and we also are interested in the decrease that happens when people are regulating. So this decrease that occurs when they're instructed to use reappraisal, and this is also a significant decrease in how negative people say that they feel. Crucially, in this study, again, we were interested in gender differences, and we didn't see any gender differences at all in either of these comparisons. So it did not appear, based on self-report, that women were any, any more or less emotional than men when they weren't trying to, to reappraise, nor were they any more or less emotional men when they were trying to reappraise. <coughs> so uh, we were sort of interested whether or not the brain would have more clues to what was going on, whether or not there might be gender differences apparent in the brain that aren't necessarily apparent in self-report. So we focused in on the amygdala, which is this amig cartoon that you see right here. And the amygdala um, is a pretty popular part of the brain. How many of you have heard of the amygdala before? Most people have at least heard of it in passing, right? So the amygdala has this reputation as being part of the reptilian brain, and it is in a sort of evolutionarily older part of the brain, and it is really involved in negative emotion, perhaps particularly involved um, in the, the negative sort of side of the spectrum. But the thing I want you to mostly know about the amygdala today, in addition to where it's situated, is all of the, th the things that it does. So you don't have to necessarily read this slide, but all of these boxes on the bottom represent outputs from the amygdala. What the amygdala has the potential to influence elsewhere in the brain and elsewhere in the body. And essentially, the amygdala is a really great organizing force on all of those aspects of emotional responding that I was talking about earlier. The amygdala influences bodily arousal systems, it, it influences freezing behaviors that are associated with negative emotion, it influences cortisol responses that course throughout the body. So it has the ability to change how other parts of our brain and how our bodies respond to emotional situations. So when we looked for gender differences in the amygdala, again this is just to remind you that the amygdala can influence all of these other things in this emotional response box, we observed an interesting pattern. We saw a very similar pattern to self-report when we were comparing the look neutral to the look negative um, trials. So there were no differences in the reactivity of the amygdala, the differences between non-emotional and emotional images, but we did see a difference between men and women when we looked at the degree to which the amygdala decreased when people were using cognitive reappraisal. So the blood flow in the amygdala actually became significantly lower in men when they were following this instruction to decrease, to use cognitive reappraisal to reinterpret the negative pictures that we were showing them. That difference in women, the green bars are women, is significantly less reduction, right? So what we're seeing is that if you were to interpret this just from the basis of the brain alone, it looks like men are being, being more successful. They're more completely squashing, quelling, allaying, if you were would uh, the, the amygdala activation, and women aren't able to achieve that same reduction in amygdala activation. They don't say that they feel any differently. And so if these were the only two pieces of information that we had, we might say, well, sometimes the brain sort of knows a little bit more than, than people do about how they're feeling, and so men are, are just better at decreasing how negatively they feel compared to women. And if this were the only part of the brain that showed a gender difference, that's what we might have concluded. But instead, we also had an unexpected result. We saw an unexpected gender difference in a different part of the brain called the ventral striatum. And in the ventral striatum, women were increasing activation in this part of the brain when they were reappraising. So when they were generating reinterpretations, this part of the brain was increasing in activation. And there was absolutely no difference in men. Men were not engaging this region of the brain whatsoever. And we weren't expecting this difference, so we had to sort of scramble to figure out what might be going on in this part of the brain. And it turns out that the ventral striatum, is, um, uh, the nucleus accumbens specifically within the ventral striatum, is engaged when individuals are anticipating rewards, experiencing humor. So there are studies that have put people in the scanner and told them jokes, which is a lot more fun than showing them negative pictures the way I do, so we'll have to get on that. Um, but when people are experiencing pleasure, this seems to be a positive emotion part of the brain. So on the one hand, women are not able to completely downregulate their amygdala activation, but they sure are doing a great job at increasing activation in a part of the brain associated with positive emotion. This is where our research took a little bit of a turn in a way that we didn't expect. So just to summarize where we are at this point, I'll keep building on as I present a little bit more. Men and women have reported that they felt the same amount of negative emotion 
but the amygdala activation was higher in women, which led us to a brand new hypothesis, especially in conjunction with this ventral striatum activation, which was maybe sometimes reappraisal is characterized by increasing positive emotion rather than just diminishing negative emotion. So maybe it's not all about trying to convince ourselves that things aren't that bad. Maybe part of it is trying to convince yourself that things are really quite good. And maybe women were just doing this more naturally than men. Even though we gave them the same instructions, maybe women were sort of taking it upon themselves to reappraise in this slightly different way. So of course, our next uh, move was to think about how to actually manipulate the kind of reappraisal that people were using, not just trust different groups of people to maybe do it more or less than other groups, but to actually come up with experimental instructions that sort of nudged people towards reappraising in a way that increased positive emotion or reappraising in a way that decreased negative emotion. And one useful way to think about the difference between these two types of reappraisal uh, requires just a little bit of background information. So a lot of emotion scientists find it incredibly useful to think of emotions as varying on at least two dimensions, right? All of the emotions that we have are somewhere on a continuum of positive and negative, so how pleasant or the valence of the emotion that we have. But there's another dimension that's important, which is the arousal level of the emotion. So you can imagine a negative emotion that's a very low arousal level, a negative emotion that, wants to, that, that makes you want to sit around and not do much versus a negative emotion that's at a high arousal level that actually makes you, that is sort of motivating you to get out there and do something to the world. So this high versus low arousal represents the sort of amount of bodily activation that we have uh, when we're experiencing an emotion. And one way to think about the difference in these two types of reappraisal is that maybe people start out in our studies or in the real world in this quadrant where they're feeling negative emotion and it's pretty highly arousing. The pictures I was showing you were not extremely arousing, but most of the time when we're, when we're working in the lab, we're showing people some fairly gruesome pictures of car crashes and things like that. So if people are starting off at a high arousal uh, negative state, they have the option to regulate their emotions to get back down to neutral, to get to a sort of not positive nor negative, not very arousing state. But the other option is that they could actually jump across the arousal axis keep their bodily arousal high, keep their level of activation and sort of engagement in what's going on high, but have that be, it, it, have that be a positive way rather than a negative way. All right. So to, to do this second study, what we need to do is figure out a way to uh, instruct people to use reappraisal to either increase positivity or decrease negativity. The problem was we weren't convinced that everybody was going to get the difference between those two things. It sounds pretty similar, right? If I came up to you today and said, how are you feeling? You said, not too great. I said, oh, you should really try to feel a little bit more positive. <laughs> or I said, oh, you should really not feel so bad. Those kind of sound like the same things, right? So we weren't sure we could instruct the same person to switch back and forth between reappraising in one way or reappraising in another. So for our first pass, what we did is we had two different groups of people, and we trained them to reappraise the same way that we did in the first study with slight tweaks to the instructions to really encourage one of the groups of people to reappraise in a way that maximized positivity and the other group to reappraise in a way that minimized negativity. So for this study, we changed the Q word we were using to be the word change rather than decrease. The nice thing about the word change is that you can define it for one group as increasing positivity and one group for decreasing negativity. You use the same instruction for both groups so that you're controlling for the exact word that they are, are using in order to cue the regulation. You've just kind of defined it differently. In this study, we also started using a color-coded background to sort of help out. So in this case, the red background means a decreased negative kind of change. So in this study, we might show somebody a picture like this, and when we were training them to use reappraisal, we would use examples much like the ones that you gave that were focused on decreasing negativity. So in this particular case, clearly these people are mourning, but maybe this mourning period won't last long. Uh, maybe it's not as bad as it, as it could have been. At least the two of them have their lives. Um, you can sort of tell yourself any number of things to decrease the negativity in that situation. The other group of participants got the instructions to change, but with this green background and with the instructions to really maximize the positivity in the situation. So if I told you to really try to tell yourself the most positive thing that could be going on for these people, 
Can you think of ways to rephrase that are maximizing the kind of positivity of the situation? Yes. Maybe they're crying because they're happy, right? Maybe these are tears of joy. That's highly possible. They end up looking very similar, right? Tears of sorrow and tears of joy. Any other? Yes. They might have something to cry about, but at least they have each other. So they might have something to cry about, but at least they have each other. That's a really great example of a reappraisal that someone might give us in this experiment. And if you were in the decreased negative condition, we would say, that's great. At least they have each other at the very least. And if you were in the increased positive condition, we would say, that's great. What you're saying is that they're actually being brought closer together by this tra tragedy, that they are going to be so grateful that this happened, right? In years to come, this is gonna be a turning point in their relationship, a turning point in their life, and, and they never would go back in time and change what happened because this is so valuable to them, right? So you're really amping up the positive value of what's happening way above and beyond neutral, right? So it's not just not quite so bad, but it's really valuable and powerful. So just as a reminder, in this particular study, what we were able to do is have one group define reappraisal as changing their emotion to decrease negativity. The other group is changing emotion to increase positivity. And we started collecting both how negative people felt and how positive people felt. Again, if you were a participant in the study, this might feel a tiny bit redundant um, to rate both positivity and negativity, but they don't, they're not always completely in opposition to each other. So the first thing we actually had to double check in this study is that these slight differences in our instructions in the training period worked, and that people in the two different conditions told themselves different sorts of things. So what we were able to do is ask people afterwards, what was it that you were telling yourself to reappraise? And we had very smart coders go through and categorize them into different categories. So people who were instructed that change meant to decrease negativity were more likely to say, oh yeah, this is fake, it's not real. None of you came up with this reappraisal. This is actually quite common, especially if you're using undergraduate students. Say, yeah, it's just a picture. Oh, it's a still from a movie. It's not really real, which is a pretty decent reappraisal. Um, or that it's not as bad as it seems. That's a pretty good blanket um, reappraisal for the decreased negative condition. And I had the coders code the reappraisals as explicitly positive only if people were so very clear that the reappraisal was taking them over the neutral mark. So they couldn't just say, oh, maybe he's getting better. It had to be, oh, maybe he's getting even better than he was before. And, it, and people were able to do that, did report doing that more often when we instructed them to than when we didn't. So this is a big relief that people were paying attention to these sort of subtle differences in these ways to reappraise. All right, so now I'm showing you what it was that people said they were feeling in these different conditions. So when we looked at how negative people said they were feeling, what you're now seeing is how negatively they felt when they were just looking and not um, instructing in the lighter colored bars and the hashed bars, if you can see the striping on them, and how they felt when they were instructed to change, again, change meaning slightly different things in the two different groups. Um, and both groups were able to decrease how negatively they felt and that difference wasn't significantly different between the groups. So both groups say, yeah, I feel a lot less negative when I'm uh, changing how I'm feeling versus not, and it doesn't matter how I'm changing how I'm feeling. But the increased positive group did feel more positive than the decreased negative group. So the increased positive was able to generate, to sort of inject positivity into the situation to a greater extent than the individuals who were instructed to use reappraisal in the decreased negative sense. So it seems like there might be a little bit of an, of, of an advantage to using the increased positive, especially as measured by <coughs> how much you're actually increasing your positive emotion. What was really interesting is we also decided to ask participants to sort of help us out with this hypothesis. So it took us a few minutes, but we actually explained to every person in the study, hey, this was after they did the entire study, sometimes emotion scientists think of emotions as varying on both positivity and neg negativity, and also on levels of bodily arousal. Where would you say that you were on, in this graph? We had literally gave them this crosshair and we had them draw a circle. Where would you say you were in this graph when you were just re reacting naturally and you weren't <coughs> regulating how you were feeling? So we asked them to mark that. We also asked them to mark how they were feeling when they were changing, and we wanted to see if there was a difference, if the decreased negative group would be more likely to go down uh, to neutral, and the increased positive group would be more likely to sort of stay up here. 
So when we averaged together all the different places that people marked on this paper, what we found is people who were instructed to decrease negative said they started pretty high on both valence and arousal, and they came pretty close to that neutral mark uh, when they were attempting to change how they were feeling. And people who were instructed to increase how positive they were feeling started in a very similar point, thank goodness, but they were able to, they, they said that their goal, where they thought they ended up at least, after they were um, done reappraising was a, in a higher arousal sort of space. So we thought this was actually pretty neat that participants in the studies might have a little bit of insight into the, the sort of difference between these conditions. And again, the participants in the study were actually never told about the other group. So if I told you that you were changing how you were feeling by increasing positivity, you never knew that there was another group of people who were actually decreasing negativity and vice versa. It's actually kind of hard to explain to someone exactly how to increase positivity without using decreasing negativity as a comparison kind of group, but we were able to do it in this particular study. I have one final piece of information for you from this study um, of increasing uh, positivity versus decreasing negativity, and it's a measure of peripheral physiology. So this is a measure of skin conductance, or how much electricity your palm is able to conduct. What do you think changes in your palm that makes it increase or decrease how much electricity it can conduct? Sweat. Yes. Yeah, so we're able to we're we're able to measure sweat in the palm, um, and how that sort of changed over time when people are increasing positivity or um, decreasing negativity. So these are the two different groups. This is their unregulated responding. So over the course of viewing that negative picture, when they're just looking and responding normally, their body responds, their palms become more sweaty over time, and then that response resolves. When people are instructed to decrease how negatively they feel using reappraisal, this response significantly is diminished, right? So this is one of those aspects of emotional responding. It's not entirely surprising that when you are trying to decrease how negatively you feel, you're also able to influence this bodily response. You're able to actually not produce as much sweat in your palms because you don't consider that, that negative picture quite as negative, right? What was very interesting is that when people were increasing how positively they felt, this reduction in their bodily response was not as strong and it was actually significantly not as strong. So individuals actually maintained a higher level of bodily arousal when they were increasing positivity compared to when they were decreasing negativity. So this is a little bit, um, this is sort of converging evidence from the body along with that graph mark that they made saying, yeah, I'm keeping my arousal levels fairly high. All right, so to summarize in study two, uh, the individuals who were assigned to these two different groups to reappraise in these two different ways said they felt the same amount of negative emotion. People who were instructed to increase positive said that they felt more positive. Uh, and they also showed higher skin conductance levels. They didn't show as strong of a reduction in their skin conductance levels um, as individuals who were decreasing negativity. So now that we had the, the now that we knew we could train people to sort of uh, to reappraise in these two different ways, we wanted to see if we could go one step further and go back to the brain. And to study this in the brain, we had to sort of do one more thing, which is train the same people to switch back and forth between increasing positivity, decreasing negativity. Again, it's pretty hard to get people to distinguish between these things, so this took a fair amount of training, but we were really interested if how aroused people said they were feeling and these skin conductance responses was gonna be reflected, for example, in their amygdala activation, right? So to go all the way back to that first study, we were sort of testing this hypothesis that instructing someone to increase positivity might result in higher amygdala activation. Uh, so we were able to do this, with a sort of complicated design. This slide is overwhelming because it was pretty overwhelming for the people in the study. Um, what they did is they did different blocks of trials, and in any block, people were switching back and forth between either changing how they were feeling or looking, but then between blocks of trials, the word change took on a different meaning. meaning. So we trained them extensively outside the scanner. Actually, my graduate student, Pri, who is sitting here today, has the patience of an angel, and she sat with individuals for about 45 minutes 
before they went into the scanner to make sure they really understood the difference between changing to decrease negative and changing to increase positive. And she explained one at a time. She made sure they gave good examples that were squarely in that camp before she moved on and explained the other one. And then she had them practice switching back and forth. So everyone was pretty confident that they knew the difference between the red change and the green change and that we could compare the different points in time when they were doing this in terms of how the brain is responding. So in this study, again, these are the same people now switching back and forth, and this is how negatively they say that they felt. So individuals felt that they, uh, said that they felt less negative when they were decreasing negative emotion. Uh, and they also actually said that they felt even less negative, significantly less negative, when they were increasing positive emotion. So trying to increase positive um, feelings actually had an effect on negative emotion as well, a stronger decrease in negative emotion. And then of course, not of course, but um, the reverse was seen for positive emotions. So people said that they felt more positive when they were decreasing negative emotion, but they felt the most positive when they were trying to increase positivity. Our really, really burning question though is what might be happening in the amygdala. These are a little bit fuzzy, um, but these are just to show you that you can measure a few different things in the amygdala. And two of the different things that you can measure is the strength of the change in blood flow to the amygdala. Most fMRI studies are actually not directly studying neural activity, they're studying the blood flow in that region. So this is just a graph of how the blood might change the amygdala, and you can change the strength of that response, you can measure the strength of that response, or the duration of it. How long is the amygdala sort of engaged when you're looking um, at that particular picture? And what we actually found were differences in the amygdala in the duration of the response, how long the amygdala sort of cared about the picture that was on the screen, if I can anthropomorphize the amygdala a little bit. So the amygdala response, uh, the duration of the amygdala response was signif significantly less when people were decreasing negative. And what was really interesting to us is that duration was decreased when people were increasing positive, but still higher than when they were decreasing negative. So this, again, is a very similar pattern of responding to that skin conductance responding, the palm sweat responding, and very similar to those arousal graphs that people made, that the amygdala seems to care a little bit longer about the negative picture you're viewing when you're trying to maximize how positive you feel compared to when you're trying to minimize how negative you feel. So this is somewhat consistent, but also somewhat confusing. If I summarize across all of these different studies, uh, what we are finding is that when you ask people how they feel, they either report that increasing positivity or decreasing negativity is the same to them, or they feel slightly more positive. So, uh, and, and in cases, they feel slightly less negative. So according to how people say that they feel, uh, Sorry, I'm using my phone as a remote and someone was trying to call me from Portland, Oregon. It was very confusing. Um, so when people are trying to increase um, how positive they feel, they say, this is great. I much prefer this to decreasing negative. I feel so much better. I feel slightly less negative. I feel more positive. If you look at how their body and their brain is responding, however, you get a slightly different picture. So a lot of people view amygdala responding and bodily measures of arousal as being higher for more emotional situations, right? So having more amygdala activation, a longer duration of amygdala activation, and more skin to conductance responding might seem like not so great of a thing. If you're trying to control how negatively you feel and your body and your brain are still at pretty high levels of output, that might indicate that you're not actually being very successful at regulating your emotions. So interpretation number one is that when people are increasing how positively they feel, they're more likely to report that they feel better, but they really don't. They don't really know what they're talking about. Their body and their brain is going crazy, and they say, yeah, this feels great, but they have no idea, and so there's a flaw in their self-report. A slightly more interesting interpretation, and one that I think is warranted, is that when people are increasing positive emotion, they're performing a transformation and they're transforming their high arousal negative emotion, they're, transferring, uh, they're transforming all that activation in their body and their brain into a different kind of emotion. So you're using the energy that you have to make that emotion become more positive rather than just trying to use it to diminish the negativity. So the SAPA reason might not just quell or allay or dumb down or diminish negativity, you might also be able to use how you think about a situation to sort of qualitatively change that emotion and keep arousal levels high. So what does this mean? If this is true, what does this mean? 
it might be that brain and bodily signals of arousal, of activation, might not always tell us how well someone is regulating their emotion. If we're looking for decreases in bodily and brain signals of, of uh, emotion, those might not be sort of the best ways um, for us to find out whether someone is successful at achieving their emotion regulation goal. The other implication is that people don't always want to feel neutral. When you're feeling badly, are you, are you really walking around thinking, yeah, I'd give anything just to feel nothing right now? <laughs> you just, sometimes, in a, in a really bad situation, I can imagine that being the case, but maybe not always. And a lot of studies of emotion regulation really have people shooting for this neutral place as their goal of kind of taking the emotion out of the equation rather than changing the equation to produce a different emotion. The other really interesting implication of this is that I think it's possible that switching or transforming a negative emotion into a positive emotion might sometimes be more feasible than quieting or quelling an overactive body, right? If your body is telling you there's something that needs to get done, right? Emotions are these really adaptive signals that say, do something, you need to do something. And so the best response might not be, no, no, no. No, don't need to do anything at all. No, I'm just gonna no, just stay nice and quiet. It might be to use that energy, transform it, turn it into something more positive. And I think it might be really, really interesting to start look at individual differences in the preference that people have for either maximizing positivity or minimizing negativity. So Pari, again, my graduate student, was really insightful when she was training all of these people at the scanner. She came back to me and she said, Oh, Kateri, it's so interesting. Some of the people, they understand maximizing positivity instantly. They get it. And when I explain minimizing negativity, they're like, huh, what's the point? Why would you just try to get rid of your negative feeling? And for some people, it's the reverse. Some people say, yep, got it, minimizing negativity, got to take the motion out of the situation, just be cool, calm, and collected about it. And some people, and, and when you tell those same people that they should maximize positivity, they think, how unrealistic is that, right? That's just, so, you're just lying to yourself about what's really going on. It's so far-fetched that it's really something positive going on. So there's really big individu individual differences in sort of how feasible or realistic or helpful these different techniques might be. Just to give you a really brief idea of the other sorts of things that I do um, in my lab, these are ongoing studies and sort of future studies. Um, my current lab manager, who is headed off to a very prestigious graduate program in the fall, Eric Wing, has worked on a study looking at the causal role of positive emotion in facilitating emotion regulation. So how does a positive mood or a positive event actually help you if something negative happens and you need to regulate your emotions? Uh, another one of my graduate students, Anna Dragic, uh, is working on a really interesting study where she asks people to reappraise either for themselves or for a friend. So she noticed that it's sometimes a lot easier to come up with these reinterpretations if it's someone else who needs help rather than if it's you. And so she's trying to document that in the lab and in the brain. Uh, my graduate student, um, Pari, is very interested in the role of emotions in decision making and the role of bodily signals in decision making. And she is engaging in a few different studies in that. I've done some work and I'm continuing to do work on the role of social context in emotion regulation. And I hate to put it up here as the role of social context in emotion regulation. It sounds very dry. This is actually a really exciting series of studies that involves collecting data about how people regulate their emotions at the Burning Man Festival that happens every year. So it's really an interesting study to do and there's incoming data every year and it's nothing at all like doing uh, research with undergraduates. So it's one of the, my favorite things that I do. Um, and I'm launching a new study as well. I'm really interested in artistic training. There's a little bit of, of data that um, artists might handle their emotions differently than non-artists, but there's not a lot of evidence, especially not um, fMRI evidence. So um, I'm actually launching a brand new study this spring looking at differences between artists and non-artists in emotion regulation, emotional awareness, uh, emotional intelligence, other sort of emotion relevant traits. So none of this happens without the village. Uh, the village includes the DU community, the psychology department, which is incredibly supportive, uh, members of my lab, um, as well as my previous mentors and collaborators, and some funding I was able to get uh, from a collaboration between the John Templeton Foundation and the University of Pennsylvania. So in addition to all of these people who deserve a lot of thanks, I would also like to thank you for your kind attention, and I'll take any questions.
having a, uh, an experimental group and a control group. Uh, I assume you didn't have a control group in this one, but, but kept doing that to get a, a, a more natural uh, response. So the, the question was whether or not I'd ever considered using different age groups. Um, and I have done a little bit of, of work actually developmentally. Um, this particular task where, task where we show people pictures, um, children as young as eight can actually do this pretty well. And we have to tell, we have to instruct them a little bit differently. We say, to, can you tell yourself a story about the pictures that helps you feel less negative? And honestly, not all of the eight-year-olds are good at it. So on the average, the eight-year-olds aren't quite as good as the 10-year-olds, and the 10-year-olds aren't quite as good as the 12-year-olds, and actually increases pr pretty regularly um, with age. And it, that seems to be a really typical pattern with a lot of other types of cognitive transformations. Um, where uh, the individuals get better sort of over over time. Um, but that was a very preliminary study there. I think there are a lot of other questions about what happens as individuals grow. And um, Heather Uri at Tufts University has actually done a lot of work on the other side of the age continuum, looking at aging adults and their ability to use cognitive emotion regulation. Because older adults actually are able to use emotion regulation better than young adults, and yet uh, a lot of their other cognitive abilities are starting to decline. So it's a little bit of a paradox where they're able to use very cognitive types of emotion regulation quite well, um, but they're not able to do very basic cognitive things quite as well as younger adults. So there seems to be some kind of, there might be some sort of internalization or practice um, that doesn't make this cognitive change quite so difficult when you're, when you're an older adult, um, and it might become a little bit more second nature. Yes? Would you say this uh, invalidates the 40 hertz hypothesis? The question was, would I say this invalidates the 40 hertz hypothesis? I'm going to have to ask you to tell me a tiny bit more about the 40 hertz hypothesis. I started reading about it today, so I don't think <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's a dirty trick. All right. <laughs> Well, why do I will the next my actual next slide is my email address. So after you finish reading about the 40 hertz hypothesis, if you want to get in touch with me, I would be happy to to think with you a little bit more about whether or not this is consistent with it or not. Yes. Do you have a goal for people to learn to train and create the behavior they need to have or want to have be successful? You know, that's what. So the question was, do I have the goal of wanting to train people? Um, in order to sort of think and feel and behave the way that they want to. That would be lovely. That would be very lovely. Uh, I myself uh, don't run a sort of clinical lab, so my lab doesn't do a lot of the actual application into the real world. But the really lovely thing about the department here at DU is that um, we work very closely with clinical labs, and so there's a lot of opportunity to actually take some of this uh, information that we're learning uh, in the scanner and in the, in the psychophysiology lab in primarily nor normal healthy adults. I, I do use some clinical populations in my work. Um, and to try to translate those into actual treatments, right? So how, how could this change how cognitive behavioral therapy is administered? You know, is there, can we figure out what some of these individual differences are so we don't ask someone who really doesn't think it's very realistic to increase positive emotion? If we, if we bring them into a therapy session and say, well, really the best thing to do is maximize how positive you feel right now, and they're thinking, oh man, that's never gonna happen, <laughs> right? Then maybe that's not the, the best match of treatment in person. Um, so it would be, I think it would be really exciting to sort of see this uh, become a little bit more applied and actually change the way that people are, are able to administer therapeutic interventions. And there, uh, there's an increasing trend to develop non-therapeutic interventions. So not necessarily individuals who are suffering from mood and anxiety disorders, but trainings for people who just want to improve their quality of life and their happiness and their feelings of wellness, um, you know, from okay to great. So I think that would also be an interesting direction to go. I mean, how you set up the procedures for a study like you did, because there are so many variables, and I think what you look at might be different. What you hear might give a different kind of reaction. Then I also think sometimes what's happening to you yourself is very different than what you see happening on the outside. So I'm wondering how you choose. That's a very good question. So the question had sort of two parts. One, it was mostly how do we sort of set up these experimental studies? How do we make decisions that balance between being able to experimentally control something that people are looking at versus having real world applicability? And the two specific questions were, have I thought about 
a, a visual stimulus, seeing something emotional versus hearing something. Um, and then also, how do you know um, that it's the same when you're looking at these emotional pictures versus when you're having experiences um, yourself? So it's, it's, it's always a trade-off. Uh, I teach a graduate course in affective neuroscience, and in that course I actually have a big slide that has on the one hand extreme experimental control. We know exactly when everything is happening at every moment in time. We know what color is on the screen at what visual points in space. And on the other hand is realisticness, right? Sort of applicability to the real world where people are experiencing things full on in, in, a, in a very sort of realistic way. And you always have to choose where you are on that continuum based on what it is you want to measure and what your question is and how much else has been done. The very first time you ask a question, you might be at a different point on that continuum than the 30th time you ask that question. You want to see how generalizable it is. So in this particular case, the visual versus auditory is actually mostly constrained by the scanner. So any of you who have had a medical MRI, the scanner clinks and clunks and, cl and, and sounds like a machine gun um, almost the whole time. And there are ways to present auditory stimuli in the scanner, but it's a lot more complicated. And a lot of the parts of the brain that we care about, like the amygdala, are driven pretty hard by the visual system. So it's a pretty decent representation of how those parts of the brain are operating. So we were sort of satisfied with that constraint. But it would be really interesting to see how things work auditorily. A lot of the animal work is actually done with auditory stimuli. So connecting up human and, and animal work um, requires sort of bridging that gap. And your second question is a really, really good one. So how do we know that when people are looking at these pictures that that's the same as when they're really feeling something personal and important to them in their everyday life? And in a nutshell, it's not exactly the same. It's a very watered down version of what's that li what that's like. And part of that has to do with ethical constraints. Uh, you know, I think from a purely, not a human standpoint, but a purely experimental standpoint, I'd love to give people false feedback about really important decisions like children and promotions and, and then see what happens. So there's no way that even for a few moments you can give someone experimentally controlled feedback that would actually cause that kind of pain. Um, and and the, the thing that, that, has, that sort of convinces me that this is still real is that participants in our studies actually respond fairly strongly to these pictures. Again, I showed you some of the more mild ones. But every year, a small handful of people ask to discontinue our studies because the pictures are too overwhelming. And so even though it might not, it, it, it won't be the same. And there are other methods of you know, having people recall moments in their own life where they felt a certain way. And, and that is sort of um, one way to kind of uh, meet in the middle. I think that the pictures are at least strong enough to be, uh, to be an, enough of, a, of an emotional response to make it worth studying. But thanks for those thoughts. Sure. The question was, have we tried to link people's ability to change to other attributes like health and wealth? Absolutely. So there are a number of different individual differences study, studies. Um, one of the most uh, robust findings is that people's ability to change and also how often they do this, right? So how often it occurs to them to actually implement reappraisal in everyday life. Um, is related to overall levels of well-being. So people who reappraise more frequently and people who do it well report that they're satisfied with their life, that they're overall happier in life, they report fewer depressive symptoms. And part of the work that Eric, my lab manager, is doing is actually trying to see which is chicken and which is egg there, right? So is it that people's ability to control negativity is producing more happiness later? Or maybe are people who are naturally more happy better at this reappraisal thing? Um, but there are also, there's a, some, not quite as strong, but there are some, also some links to cognitive functioning. So executive functions or some of these sort of more um, traditional intelligence measures. Um, there's not a perfect correlation between them, um, but in general, people who do well in certain kinds of, of these um, intelligence measures also do better um, at reappraisal. I'm not sure if there's been any studies of financial well-being and reappraisal, um, but I can, I can imagine that would be interesting to look at from a, a number of different standpoints. Yes. Have you done any, try to see any correlation between those who've been regularly exposed to negative, you know, experiences versus those who hardly ever have any negative experiences? Because you would think there would be, that would be an 
That's a very good question. So the question was, are there any differences um, in people's ability to do this sort of thing amongst people who have been regularly exposed to negative experiences versus people who have not been exposed to as many? People are just starting to ask this question. So Iris Moss, who used to be here, has a lot of really interesting data on individuals who have experienced stressful life events. And the, um, this last study that I showed you, I didn't mention it, but we actually pre-screened women of everyone who was in that study had recently experienced a stressful life event. So the death of a loved one, the loss of a job, the loss of a house, um, something like that. So I actually, I'm, I'm most interested in that question. That's where I'd like to go next, is how does our previous experience, both distant and sort of more recent, um, impact our ability to do this? Yes. So during these trials, uh, in essence, it seems like you get uh, people an assignment, and that is think differently about this observation. And it seems to me that's not a lot different from what I give myself when I either have observed, experienced myself, or act. And, and those are three important things that, that we all do in life and maybe lots of other stuff. But how I feel about what I've seen or what I've experienced and how I effect or influence those feelings certainly has an effect on many things, including outcomes. And, and I think humans tend to be optimizers. We tend to think about results and outcomes. So uh, um, does, how does a reducing, uh, re rethinking an experience or an observation in terms of down, Rating negative, Keep, keeping arousal levels high and upgrading positivity. How does all, that all work out in the scheme of, success, of, of achieving success? A couple of other people have talked about. Sure. So the question is, when when we feel something, the out the that there are other ramifications of changing how we feel that we're not just sitting around feeling something and saying, huh, I think I'll change how I feel about that. Usually we're engaged in other tasks, right? We're finishing papers, we're revising grants, we're, <laughs> uh, we're meeting with students, we're cooking dinner, anything else that we're doing. So how does changing how we feel actually change the other things that we're doing as well? Another really interesting question, and this hasn't been something that my lab has looked at directly, but there are a few other labs, if you like, if you, if you email me, I can send you some of, some of their papers, that have showed that in many cases, changing how you're feeling for the goal of changing how you're feeling also helps you achieve those other goals, right? So uh, if, I am, uh, if I have a large assignment due and I'm very nervous and, and doubting myself that I can complete it on time, it's good for me to actually reduce those feelings so that I can stay on task and concentrate. There are actually other situations where minimizing negativity, even if you're maximizing positivity, where minimizing negativity is not helpful. So a few of these examples are, it's been shown that in negotiations, for example, in a business context, that experiencing and displaying genuine negative emotion is sometimes advantageous. There are other people who have become very good at using bodily signals of anxiety to fuel productivity. That doesn't sound familiar to anyone in this room, does it? <laughs> right? So there are times when some people actually will willingly make themselves more anxious because they believe it will help them achieve a particular goal. And, and so, again, I think that's a really exciting direction that people are going, that it's not always about trying to feel better, um, whether it's minimizing negativity or maximizing positivity, but sometimes it's about achieving the correct emotion for another purpose. Mm -hmm. Yes? I have a couple questions. Have you worked with violent offenders and poor impulse control and how that correlates with the emotion and um, also language? Um, have you studied how if you don't have the language of being successful, how do you become successful? Or how do you not be negative if you don't have the words for positive? Mm -hmm. So the, um, the question was, have I studied violent offenders or people with impulse control? The quick answer to that is no, I haven't. That would be very interesting. Um, it's, it's easy to, to guess that those who have across the board impulse control problems might not be quite as good as other people at using this sort of, of cognitive control to change their emotions. 
And the second question was, what about the role of language? So what if people don't have the language? Um, there is a lot of really interesting be work being done on language and emotion. And one of the things I think is fascinating about reappraisal is that it's very linguistically driven, right? When we're training the young, the eight to 10 year old kids, we say, tell yourself a story about what's going on. Um, and I don't know if anyone has actually tested this, um, but I personally view the ability to put your uh, put how you're feeling into some kind of linguistic representation as a necessary middle step. Before you can change how you're feeling, you have to acknowledge how you're feeling in some way. It might be conscious, it might be unconscious, but you have to sort of make yourself aware of what it is that you're feeling, what's making you feel that way. In this particular task, a lot of times you have to sort of tell yourself, oh man, that guy's sick, he's in a hospital room, okay, what can I change about that to make it better? You have to sort of identify the target to change, right, before you can get in there to change it. So I suspect that you're right, that language has a lot to do with that, and that for someone who doesn't have a, a, a good use of language, it might be really tricky to get them to use this particular type of emotion regulation. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you said that mindfulness and, and breath work and reducing the like fight or flight mm -hmm. mechanism. And so I'm just kind of wondering if you've ever thought about, you know, similar to what you're saying, like if the words are removed, you know, is there is there a sort of a parallel way you could look at it without the words is sort of a question and or I'm also wondering like in a way it sounds like what you found is a little bit different than this idea of, you know, if I reduce my physiological reaction, mm -hmm. I'll feel better. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I kind of like what you're saying, like, you know, because I don't like for people to sort of say, you know, like, calm down, you know. <laughs> Even though I like to calm myself down, but it's like you're kind of saying, make a quicker jump, go from a heightened negative to a heightened positive. But somehow this seems to me to not go with what I've read about, you know what I sure. mean? Like, how sure. do you feel positive in an aroused state or I don't know. Right, so the, the question was about mindfulness and that yeah, a lot of mindfulness is A, not particularly <laughs> linguistic, and B, um, fo it does focus on a more of a, a bodily calming response. Yeah. And so I think it's really interesting if you go back to this sort of idea that there are many aspects of emotional responding, for different, for, for in some cases, there are, there are different points of entry into this system, right? So I've talked a lot about changing that representation in the brain, which has downstream consequences. But there are lots of things that you can directly do to your body. And so, it, again, if, if, if in a particular situation, it is a good goal to sort of reduce the amount of bodily responding, because even though in a positive context, some amount of bodily arousal might be good, if you've got a chronically activated sort of sympathetic fight, flight or flight, fight or flight thing going on, that's not good news, right? Yeah. So it's, it's this chronic overactivation and never being able to sort of quell it down that is actually really bad for both physical and mental health. So there are other points of entry where you can directly intervene with physiology. People do this with medication all the time, right? They directly intervene with their physiology. So it, it might be that those techniques are a little bit skipping um, some of the cognitive changes that I was talking about. But I also think that there are some types of reappraisal that are a little bit closer to mindfulness than others. There are some things you can tell yourself about a situation that might actually be really similar to, to what you might do in a, in a mindfulness sense. And now that you bring it up, there are some types of, I, I maybe why not call them reappraisal, but there are some types of cognitive changes that are non-linguistic. So people have done studies where you can have people imagine this, uh, an emotional situation and then just literally zoom out right? Literally kind of press the, the zoom out button in your mind and, and picture yourself as further away from the situation. And that has a calming effect. I have a feeling there's a lot of that going on in some of the mindfulness, mindfulness techniques. And there are, again, if you do, if you do email me, there are some people who are really focusing in on what aspects of mindfulness are helpful, what aspects of mindfulness are sometimes not as helpful.
question was whether or not we have any plans to do follow-ups on the individuals in our studies to see how they are emotionally and well-being wise and who knows maybe financially you know four or five years from now that would be so nice <laughs> that would be so nice we currently don't have any plans to, to, to do that um, mostly it wasn't part of our original design um, and, and it also wasn't part of our sort of the original funding for this study um, we do have a few studies where we have a short-term follow-up we have like five weeks rather than five years um, and those are difficult to do because a lot of people sort of um, you know fall out and, and you're not able to follow up with um, but we do see a few hints of, of things changing even in sort of five weeks and I will say that anecdotally again I don't run a clinical lab I'm not a clinical psychologist but every once in a while some people come through and they do our studies and you know we're mostly concerned about whether or not they're following instructions and they're alert and awake and all of these sorts of things and they say thank you so much this is this was so interesting for me to sort of formalize you know how I'm thinking about these things in this way and to really think about oh yeah here I'm trying to change how I'm feeling here I'm not some of the, the the studies that we do at the Burning Man event people say this was such a cool part of my experience to fill out this survey <laughs> you never hear that from the undergraduates <laughs> maybe one more question yes um, have you ever tried to um, correlate some of your findings with the Myers-Briggs type indicator, where you know some people are more naturally looking at the positive, and some people are more net natural at looking at the negative, and how successful, if you try to explain the difference, do you do you find that they always go back to their more mm -hmm. natural way of looking at things? So the question was, have we ever tried to look with any personality variables, like the Myers-Briggs, for example, to see if there's any sort of natural correspondence between different personality types and how easily they take to, to reappraising? And the second part of the question was, if you teach someone to reappraise, do some people sort of uh, you know, fall out of it more easily than others. And I haven't done anything with the Myers-Briggs in particular, but we have looked at the sort of five-factor personality index. So we've looked at neuroticism, for example. Um, and we actually don't see a, a, a huge relationship between neuroticism and reappraisal. Sometimes there's a slight correlation where the better that people are at reappraising, the less um, neurotic they are. Um, but what neuroticism seems to be a little bit more correlated with is actually people's unregulated response. Their response to the pictures when they're not trying to change how they feel is highly related to their neuroticism scores. And so in some ways, I actually think that it's, it, it might not be unrealistic to think of reappraisal as a way to overcome some of these personality differences. And we have some brand new data, actually, that's from a twin study um, that, is, that shows that people's, uh, how often people reappraise is actually significantly less heritable than neuroticism. So it might be a little bit less nature driven I hate to say it in those terms but it actually might be more of a flexible thing that you can learn that might overcome some of these other differences okay well thank you